here with her family on a sabbatical in Kate Siri. And she's, of course, very well known for her work on reasoning about uh, probabilistic programs, in particular the refinement in that context. But more recently, she has focused her attention towards security, and in particular, secure information flow. And that's also the topic of her talk today. So, welcome. Um, Thank you very much, yeah, I'm very happy to be here for sabbatical and also at this time. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about some ideas that uh, I and my co-workers have been working on for the last something like uh, five or six years. So um, as Peter said, I've been working in probabilistic semantics for a long time, but uh, more recently in the last five or six years or so, we've been looking specifically at how to come up with some new ways to think about uh, confidentiality and how it might be lost um, when you're working with some system which has some secret in it and uh, the just due to the fact that you're using some of those secrets, some information about it gets lost. So we want to have some good ideas about how to think about uh, what all of that means. So most of the talk, so maybe about uh, half of the talk will be on some of the a quick tutorial on those foundations, and then hopefully I'll get to talk about a couple of case studies that we've been doing to apply uh, some of this work. So I thought I'd start uh, talking, uh, giving a, a very brief history on information flow. Um, so there's an important part which is uh, left off this slide, which begins sort of like in the 1949 or so paper by Shannon. Uh, so you just take that, that that's, that's, uh, that's a really important piece of work, which um, uh, is still referred to today, but I haven't put it on this slide. Um, so where the, uh, the background specifically to looking at quantitative information flow really uh, sort of where people started to get worried about it was around about the 1970s uh, when uh, people started compiling these databases of statistics and uh, so they started to worry about the privacy breaches published in data. So governments collect statistics about everybody. There's one going on in Australia uh, right now, or uh, sort of like a month ago. And then the uh, people collecting this data, they sort of say, you know, the number of people of this age and, and so forth. Um, and so people were worried about information that's being released, could that actually have an effect on individuals uh, or uh, small groups of people? So then uh, the next sort of big thing in computer science, really, in the semantics of this, these uh, of security was around about the early 80s, where Gogan and Masegue, they came up with uh, this uh, formalism of non-interference security. And what this, um, what they were trying to do was try and model and reason about uh, some systems where there was some secret information. Um, they sort of split the secret, uh, the, the states into sort of two parts, uh, high level information, which was the secret and low level information, which were, was not secret. And then just uh, imagined that an observer of the system um, would might, may be able to make uh, inferences about the high level, the secret, just by observing the program behavior and the values of the sort of low level state. And so they came up with, well, so they formalized this idea of non interference. And so they said a system was non interference secure if none of those observations could actually tell you anything about the secret. So this was an important step, but it turned out to be quite, uh, th it turned out to be too severe. Um, to really be useful uh, for uh, systems with secret data. And then round about uh, the 90s, we've got this idea of the lattice of information formalized. And this gives you, this is a really nice idea of being able to compare systems. So you can say this, this system, however secure it is, at least it's more secure than this one over here. And so this is sort of coming to this idea of refinement, which is what we use a lot in uh, program verification. But it's not used so much in uh, security, although it is here in Zurich, which is really nice. Um, then uh, around about the 1995s were, appeared all of these side channel attacks. And this is, you know, even if you put all your, your cryptography and whatnot into securing your data, just the very fact of it running on a physical system and uh, means that 
stuff about that data is still being leaked. So people, uh, so, you know, wow. And then, uh, so then round about the 2000s appeared in the computer science idea of uh, quantitative information flow. And this was the idea that, okay, so we've got these examples where information really is leaking. We can't seem to do anything about it, or at least it's really hard to do anything about it. So maybe, so here's a new thought. Let's try and understand how severe those leaks are in terms of what an, what an observer can learn about the actual secret, and let's try and quantify it, and let's try and figure out whether we can say, therefore, once we've got a good understanding of what all of this stuff means in terms of security, then we might be able to say, well, okay, this system does leak us small amount of information, we can measure how small that is, and we can interpret it in a scenario where we are happy that it's not actually significant data, so we can, uh, so we can get some uh, sort of idea about um, how secure the data is. Um, so, of course, when people started to, to do this, they went back to the 19... 94, I think, paper it is by Shannon, and they used Shannon entropy to get a handle on, to, to, to give an interpretation for these leaks. But then when sort of people was, uh, uh, started looking at this, it turned out that actually there's other ways to measure information flow, and perhaps demonstrated by a number of, uh, uh, of examples, perhaps Shannon is not actually the best thing that we can use because it can on occasion give um, make us feel safer than we should be. So it can say not very much information is leaking, but actually um, in, in some examples it's quite clear that if your attack is just trying to guess the value of the secret, then uh, a lot of information might be leaking. Uh, that a lot of information might be leaking that the attacker is able to use. That's the, so the important thing. So these new ideas, uh, these new entropies, uh, mid-entropy, guessing entropy, which I'll say a little bit about uh, in a moment, and uh, appeared, and so people got interested in those things. And then when we actually started go back, going back and looking at the foundations of these things, it turns out that um, there's this thing, generalized entropy, which I'll talk about in a moment. There's many, many different ways that you might want to express your security objectives and you can express these things using generalized entropy. And they all give you a different perspective on how much information is flowing. So if you can get a good idea about your, uh, what the attacker can do and, uh, and, and how much information he can use, then you can use these generalized entropies to, to give you some answer about how, much, how important is the information. That so then, uh, and then we can use this, these sort of new ideas to, to give us some idea about small and is it so um, so let's start at the beginning so this is the, like the tutorial bit of the of the talk um, when you're talking about confidentiality you've got to have this idea of a secret because otherwise you know it doesn't really make sense so what we're going to do is we're going to model a secret as something that an attacker can try to guess and so we're going to use this uh, chi for basic the basic type for secrets. So you just imagine maybe uh, 256 bits, okay, or you know however many bits you want to keep secret, and that's the size of your um, of your uh, 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 that's the range over which you can choose your secret. And then we're actually going to model the uh, how safe is that secret by giving it a probability distribution. So we're using this d chi for probability distributions over secrets. And these are um, discrete distributions. So this, the, the, um, the distribution really models how, how secret is the secret. So if you've got a uniform distribution, most people say, well, the attacker doesn't know anything about the secret because whatever he chooses, uh, he's got the same chance as any other secret. So he doesn't really know anything. But if you've got um, some more informed prior knowledge, you might, if it's passwords or something, you might say, well, you know, most people set their passwords to the names of their cats or dogs or whatever. So then you would put a distribution where it, you gave more weight to cat and dog names and less weight to, you know, some other words that people... So 
now um, we can use entropy uh, traditionally, as Shannon did. So this is supposed to be a picture of uh, uh, Shannon entropy. So this measures, Shannon entropy measures uh, uncertainty uh, in, in data. So that might be the uncertainty of the attacker's uh, knowledge of a particular secret. So I'm going to show you quite a lot of graphs. I'm going to try very hard uh, not to put formulas up because you can go to the papers, you know, to get the details of formulas. Occasionally they have slipped into the slides, uh, so, but mostly it'll be pictures sort of like this. And along the x-axis down here, this um, is uh, the Shannon entropy of a two-bit secret because that I can draw that. So here is the uh, probability that I think the secret is zero, and along here is the prob... So I'm very certain that the secret is zero. Well, it's exactly zero if it's over here, and it's exactly one if it's over here, and if it's in the middle, then it's a probability distribution of 50-50 between zero and one. And here, that has very high uncertainty in Shannon entropy. So the higher uh, for entropy, the better it is in terms, in terms of keeping... Uh, your secret secret. But here now, here's another uh, idea for an entropy. Uh, so this is, uh, comes from Bayes' risk. And so this idea is that, um, so this gives the average over $1 fines to the attacker if he incorrectly guesses the secret. So imagine that you've got this secret bit and the attacker is going to either choose zero or one. And obviously, uh, and he's going to, if he gets it wrong, he's going to lose a dollar. Okay, if he gets it right, that's good for him. So this is really measuring the cost to the attacker of a scenario of his, of his uh, choices of actions, which is, do I guess zero or do I guess one? So obviously here on this side of the graph, he's going to guess zero, and he's going to get it exactly right when it's here, and it's, he's going to be uh, less He's going to uh, be wrong more often as he comes to 50-50, and then we swap over, okay, and he's going to guess the other one. So again, the higher the entropy, the more uncertainty. But here, this is really directly capturing the, the idea that the attacker is actually going to try and guess your secret, and it's going to cost him some money if he gets it wrong. Here's another one that you see in the literature. This is guessing entropy. Again, we've got... Um, uh, this uh, two-bit secret here, and here the uh, so this this models uh, an attack where an attacker gets some number of guesses, right? So he first of all guesses, and then he's told no, you're wrong. So he gets to choose again, no, you're wrong, and so on. So this actually gives the guessing entropy gives the expected number of guesses it takes for the attacker to guess correctly your secret. So the longer he has to guess, the more he has to pay. Yeah. So here, of course, we've only got... Uh, he always has to guess one. So, uh, so if the secret is zero, then he guesses zero, and it only costs him one guess. But otherwise, you know, he's got some chance of getting it right, some chance of getting it wrong. And so if he gets it right, then he doesn't have to guess again. But if he guesses it wrong, then he has to do it again. So in the worst case, um, he's going to have to pay... 1.5 on average, okay, for his guessing. And again, the higher the, en the uh, entropy, the more uncertainty. Um, but the difference between Shannon and these other scenarios is it's really focusing on what the attacker is doing and how much he has to pay. If he, if so different secrets have different... Uh, so just in summary here on the left-hand side are the three graphs that we just saw, just so that... Um, uh, you can see uh, sort of sort of similarities. Um, different secrets have different associated risks. So the risk is really um, how much the uh, attacker is is going to succeed in his whatever guessing uh, attack he's, he's going to employ. Uh, indistinguishably between secrets. Um, so these are the sort of properties. So now we're getting into can we get some, a good set of mathematical properties to, uh, to be able to describe whole classes of these kinds of things. Um, so what we want is that uh, these are going to be continuous because indistinguishably between secrets. So if you're, it's hard to distinguish a pro uh, secrets in probability, it should be hard to distinguish them in this entropy. Um, 
And finally, averaging between uncertainties increases the overall uncertainty. So if I, if I have a... Um, if I have a prior knowledge here and a prior knowledge here, and I just take the average, then if I had a prior knowledge which is combining those two probability distributions, then my uncertainty should be greater for that combined, um, for sort of fuzzing between those two, uh, those, those two priors. And here, uh, so we can actually write these things down in mathematics. So entropy then is a function from secrets to reals. Uh, it's continuous and it's concave. So that's the. Uh, so if we take the uncertainty of a prior average between those two things, then it should be no. Uh, it should be at least the average of the two uncertainties. That's the idea that if you spit something, then you're actually giving the attacker a little bit more knowledge, and he's going to use it. So every single uh, any, anything that leaks is going to be uh, used by the attacker. So should I? Uh, so just before I get to saying uh, how uh, you can change the risk, um, I'm imagining an attacker is a passive attacker. He's just making inferences. So we imagine that he knows, say, the program code. He knows something about the secret, as in he's got prior knowledge about the secret, and in particular he will know what set of values is drawing the, the uh, he, he, available for the secret. Um, but he's not actually injecting any attacks, any sort of malicious. He's not doing anything malicious. He's just, like, watching. But he's very careful at watching, and he's very careful at, uh, at using the knowledge that comes out. So here is a tiny little uh, mechanism. So a mechanism is just this general term that you see in the literature, which basically means it's uh, something happened. It's like a, a call to, a, to a, a database, or it might be some, uh, some, some program which is leaking some information side channel. OK, it's, it's just um, some piece of code which leaks some information. So here. Here's how we can change the risk. So here we imagine we have a program variable x, and we assign it secretly, by which we mean that you know the attacker can't actually get inside of the machine and see precisely which value is set. So x does get exactly one of these two values, but the attacker doesn't know which one he gets. So once x is assigned, then x is a specific value, and the prior part of what I showed you before is simply in the the model of the attacker's view of what it could be. It's not actually what x gets. x doesn't get dis distributions. So then what happens is that maybe there's some computation, and, I've, and maybe there's some side channel. And uh, through analyzing what the side channel does, I've summarized it in this single statement, which I say x, uh, that some information is leaked. And what information is leaked? Well, the low order bit of x is leaked. So what does this leak tell us about the uh, tell the attacker about the secret? Well, if one is leaked, then the attacker deduces that the secret x is one, right? Because that's the only value out of those three, zero, one, and two, where the low order bit is one. Okay? If he sees zero, then he says, well, he can rule out one. Okay? So he can still do something, and he can then says, well, the secret must be zero or two. But beyond that. <coughs> He doesn't actually know. So you can imagine him using this as saying, well, let's, um, I'll wait for the leak, and then I'm going to just follow my brute force attack. Maybe he can do that. And if he sees a one, then, well, he doesn't have to do his brute force attack at all. He knows, he knows that the password is one. And, but if he sees uh, two, then maybe that's reduced you know, maybe it takes him a very long time to try three things, but he can try two things very quickly indeed. So then that would mean that he sort of reduces an attack down to something which uh, might make it worthwhile for him. So now how would we measure these things? How, what's this got to do with the uh, entropies that I showed you just before? Well, so, um, so basically what we do to say that the an information has leaked out is that we are inspired by Shannon's uh, mutual information, which gives a measure for, for um, 
how well our observations correlated with secret data. So what's really going on here is that we've got a joint distribution between the secret X and the observations. You, uh, and so we want to know is how well correlated are those observations with X. This is kind of the Shannon mutual information. So this number here says that uh, gives some uh, value of the correlation. If the difference is, um, is very high, then that means that w they're well correlated. And if it's low, then it means they're not correlated. So high numbers here means that a lot of information has come out. Lower numbers means that not, not such a lot of information has come out. So we can do this, actually. I'm going to explain where I get these numbers in a minute. But we can do this um, with the Bayes risk and the guessing entropy as well to get these uh, sort of uh, figures out. And the interesting things about here is that these measure the actual dollar amounts uh, benefit to the attacker in following those two uh, scenarios, those two guessing and cost analysis, analysis scenarios that I showed you before. So where are these uh, numbers coming from? Well, uh, so uh, show you. Um, so what we do is that we look at the Shannon entropy, which I call H, the Bayes risk, uh, which, which is that graph I showed you before, and the guessing entropy. We measure that on the prior before, and we measure the conditional, uh, exactly the conditional entropy afterwards, which is taking the observations into account. And then we take the difference between those two numbers. Right. So... Um, we can write all of these things down in maths. Ap apologies, this is one of the formula slides. It won't be there very long, um, but this is just to show you that uh, we can do it. So we introduce these ideas of loss functions. These are loss functions from decision theory. So we imagine that an attacker uh, has a finite set of uh, actions. Sorry, that should say actions rather than strategies. So an attacker has a finite set of choices in his particular scenario, and they're parameterized by this W. And then for each uh, attack strategy, his, uh, uh, then we can, uh, if he, for a particular action W, if he guesses X for that action, then it costs him LWX if he gets the guess wrong. Okay? And then what we do to calculate the uncertainty is we minimize, we take the average over the particular prior, which is this pi, so the average over his losses, and then we minimize over his possible strategies. That's, what, that's where those numbers came from. And you can do this, you can set up the, um, here, are the here are our three favorite entropies. So for fixed W, the function LW is the cost function for that strategy, uh, sorry, for that action. And consider the function from secrets to reals. It becomes a tangent to this entropy curve. Okay, so here we can say in the Bayes risk one for this, uh, we've, he's only got two secrets to guess. He can either guess uh, that X is one and then it costs him a dollar if he gets it wrong. And that corresponds to this tangent here for his costs. Or he can uh, guess zero, and it costs him a dollar, and that corresponds to that tangent. So each of these, this is an LW, and that is an LW, and similarly for guessing entropy. Okay. And in fact, you can do exactly the same thing for Shannon entropy too, because the curve is determined by all of the uh, tangents, and each of these tangents correspond to one of these loss things. But uh, it's a little bit harder to... So you, you can get this weird LW for Shannon, but it's a little bit hard to say precisely what it means in terms of the attacker actually doing stuff. But you can interpret it in that way if you like. So, just, uh, so let's just see how this is working um, uh, for this particular example in Bayes' risk. So the attacker, um, so here I've just made it a bit uh, 
going back, it's a bit more interesting than those diagrams that we just saw because we've got three secrets. Um, but so this is not the full range of, uh, of options, but here's something that the attacker could do. Uh, so he's got three options in his W, set of W. A, he can guess that X is zero, costs him one if he guesses wrong. B, he guesses one, and C, he guesses two. So that, those are his um, things that uh, he might like to do. And he can employ it here, and that gives his uh, costs when he doesn't know anything, or he can employ it here, and that is his cost if once he's uh, taken the leak into account. And so what those differences are measuring is actually uh, how good is his ability to change his strategy to lower his costs in the case that he takes the information into account. And so uh, uh, here is a little graph um, uh, describing some of that. Suppose, uh, um, consider the strategy randomly select A or C. So here, because I can only draw two-dimensional things, um, I'm just showing you what happens if he's trying to um, uh, guess whether X is one or not. So along here, it's less likely that X is one. Along here, it's more likely that X is one. And in the middle, he doesn't have an idea. So when it's sort of over here, when it's less likely that X is one, his best, um, his, his best choice of A or C or B is to choose A or C. And in this case, when he knows it's more likely that X is one, it's his best choice is to choose. Okay, so if that's what he's trying to do, then this gives the, uh, depending on the uh, particular prior, this gives his average costs. This is what it looks like after he has taken the leak into account. And here, he always uses A or C unless he observes one. Okay, and in that case, he can reduce his costs down to this uh, straight line. Okay, so there's, uh, it is on the left-hand side and there it is on the right-hand side. So really, just to summarize all of that, then the change of entropy is a measure of the effectiveness of his strategy change. And here, very quickly, are the formulas just to show um, how it works. Uh, so here on the top, uh, we've got the... Um, so this is the... What's happening here is we're actually taking Bayes... We're, we're applying Bayes' formula to calculate a set of posterior distributions given each observation. And for each of those um, posterior distributions, so if we have an observation A, then we calculate this posterior distribution using this Bayes' formula. And to get the, the average um, entropy after take, uh, on taking the leaks into account, we just apply the same UL so that was the cost function to the, um, to the posteriors, and we average it over the probability that we actually see that observation. How much time do I have left? 18, okay. Um, so I think I, I will have to skip this because I want to get to show you some of the, um, uh, some of the case studies that we've actually been doing. But just to say, just in case the, anyone wants to talk about this afterwards, an important part of this is this idea of going to generalized entropies not only gives uh, good operational uh, ways to understand how an attacker is actually going to use this information, but it also enables you to define a, uh, an abstraction relation, a, a, a refinement relation between... Um, programs, because we are applying this to programs, where, where when you go up the refinement relation, you're also improving not only functional correctness, you're also improving security in the sense that if you say that this is refined by that, then not only are the functional characteristics consistent, so you really know that this leaks less than that, because against any of these entropy measures, in the way that I've shown you, this one, uh, the, uh, the change in entropy is less for the more refined program than it is for the refined program. 
So that's, that's uh, sort of laying the foundations for where we want to go, is to have a nice theory of where we can actually have do refinements which preserve this uh, sort of in quantitative information flow. So, um, okay, so where I want to talk for the last few minutes, last 15 minutes, is trying to apply some of these ideas, examples. And uh, so, looked at side channel analysis, which I might be able to get to today. Um, and some voting, which I'll tell you about. And then, of course, we've, we're, what we're, where we are going to next is try to develop reasoning techniques based on refinement to verify a number of security protocols. We've got a bunch of examples uh, of those as well, but I won't be able to tell you about those today. Okay. So, voting. Right. So, uh, so I'm... I'm uh, work, working in Australia, and uh, and there they have quite a complicated voting system, at least for me, because I grew up in the UK, where voting is quite simple. You just check a box. But in Australia, uh, things are a little bit more uh, interesting. Um, but what you do have to... so But what you need absolutely need to have about any voting protocol is that you need... Uh, one of the basic principles is that uh, voters should have some measure of some some confidence that their vote is going to be done in secret, so they don't have to tell anyone who they're they're voting for. And secondly, is that votes are actually properly assembled and counted so that the democratic process is properly carried out. So that's uh, sort of like the integrity of the vote. And so in Australia, as we'll see in a moment, um, we have this idea of preferential voting. So there's a whole array of candidates, and it can be many, many, because anyone can put themselves up as a candidate, pay $2,000 or something, and there you can be, you know, stand for whatever you like. And then you appear on the ballot slip, which we'll see in a moment, and then voters, the task of voters is to order their preferences. So they say, oh, I want Mr. Smith first, but if I can't have him, I'll have, you know, Mrs. Jones or, or whatever. So they can actually put ticks in many, many boxes. And then what happens is that the votes are collected and then the first preferences are counted. And then in some cases where, you know, maybe Mr. Smith got very few votes, first preferences, he, he's, he's, he's eliminated from the vote. And then his sec the second preferences of Mr. Smith's vote are then put on to the tallies of the other candidates. And, uh, and then some proportion of that data is published. So people are always talking about how much information is actually flowing in this process. You know, is it actually, could it potentially be damaging voters' privacy? So nobody had really sort of, people had talked about it a lot, but nobody had actually done it. So we thought, well, we'll try to apply some of these information flow ideas to this, uh, to this particular problem. So uh, just a little bit more about uh, voting. So this is an example of a voting slip in from the New South Wales uh, election for Senate. So these are all names of voters and their party affiliations uh, sort of go along the top. So if you really, really want to, um, want to express your, uh, your right to, to order these things, you can order all of these candidates. There's this quick way of voting that you could just vote for one party, but essentially you could um, tick all over the place in this particular box. And the, the voting slips really are kind of, you know, like this. Um, all right, so, uh, so the other problem with um, voting in Australia is that, uh, that Australia is actually a huge country. And just to... Um, so, sorry, this isn't all of Europe. I just grab, yes, I know, I just grabbed this off the web. I've been, to I've been told off about this slide before. But anyway, of the selection of countries, there are quite a few countries from Europe here. 
and, um, and uh, quite a lot of them fit, uh, fit in Australia. So, and the thing about it is, so Australia is a, big, is a big country, but also voting is compulsory. So wherever you live in Australia, you know, if you live in France or Germany or wherever, you still have to go to one of the polling places, which might be in a totally different country, and you and sort of you have to get there. Uh, right, so here, for example, if you live here in this nice desert area, you have to drive to these places, and then you're given a voting slip this big, and you have to, to I guess they make it worth your while <laughs> to drive all of that way. Rightio, so how can privacy be compromised in all of this? So, of course, you see that, uh, so here, so this is real voting data, which is published on the web um, uh, that I just grabbed. But this, uh, so this is the, the way that, these are just the first preferences, I think, the way that people voted for the district of Mile Lakes, which is uh, sort of here, close to Romania, um, in this picture. And some of the, not everybody voted in the polling places in Mile Lakes, because maybe they were on holiday. And in this particular example, some people uh, were in Sydney. So in Australia, so in Australia, you can go anywhere you like in the country and you can vote for your, for your district. Okay? Because voting is compulsory and if you make something compulsory, therefore the Electoral Commission is obliged to make it possible for you to vote. Okay? So, for example, here, if you look at all of the, uh, the tallies here, this, I can't remember the names of the, all of these parties, but this candidate got uh, over 6,000 votes here. But of the people, of the uh, 14 or so people that uh, voted in the Sydney Town Hall for the Mile Lakes District, nine of those people... Only one voted for this candidate and four voted for that candidate. So with these small numbers, you might think, well, you know, is uh, of people that voted there, how much of their privacy has been compromised, if you like? So what's their privacy risk, if you like, if uh, this is the kind of thing that's happening? So just quickly here, so what we did is we, um, we applied this model of Quantitative information flow to this problem. Of course, we made uh, we made a few um, assumptions. So we assumed a uniform prior of votes, and then we said, well, what is the what are the important privacy questions? Because all of these numbers coming out depend very much on what question are you are actually going to ask. What entropy are you going to apply to this particular problem? So we looked at two. One was, what's the chance that an observer, once he sees the election results, can actually guess uh, what somebody voted for, so what, what they put on that uh, ballot paper. So that was the first thing that we asked. So that was a bit like Bayes Bridges. The second one we asked is, what is the expected number of voters cast ballots can be guessed correctly? Okay? And so, so then we... Uh, so preferential voting is pretty complicated. So what we did is we looked at the first past the post voting system. So that's where you just tick one preference, if you like, and um, so sort of that's what you do. And it turns out, um, and then, and so, and so we looked at the information flow for these two privacy questions for that particular voting protocol. Because we just wanted to see the very, but that's the least amount of information that you can possibly release. You've got to tell people who won, right? Um, so that has to be released. So we wanted to look at that to start with. And, um, and then we thought, well, there's two ways that the uh, Electoral Commission can release the information. They can just say who won, or they can say, give detailed information about the tallies that each candidate got. And then, of course, that includes who won, because whoever got the most in the tallies is, uh, is, is the winner of the, uh, of, of the election. And so what was interesting here, applied to both of these two questions, is that on average, if you're looking at that difference in entropy, there is no difference in entropy. The, the average numbers are exactly the same whether or not you release the tallies for these two elections. Right? So it seems weird. But that's what happened, and we thought, well, how, you know, how could that happen? And it's, it's mathematically, it's because you compare, remember the entropies, and what those numbers are telling you. They're telling you how.
and you're able to change your strategy. And it turns out that in both of these scenarios, your best, uh, the uh, attacker's best strategy, once you take the information into account, is to guess the winner. So you take a voter and you say, I guess that you voted for the candidate who won. And that turns out to be his best guess. And if you know how, by how much he won, still your best guess is to, is to guess the winner. So therefore, in both of those scenarios, So in both of those scenarios, um, since the so in both of those scenarios, since the since the change of strategy is exactly the same, therefore it's no surprise that the that the information flow is exactly the same. So this is quite quite nice, and when you think about it, it's not it's not surprising. When, but it was surprising to us to to start with. But when you think about it, you can say, well, I can immediately increase integrity by releasing the results, and I don't increase uh, I, I I don't uh, increase the privacy risk. So then, what we did was that uh, it turns out that if you think about the um, uh, the kind of information which is released, even in preferential voting, that is a little bit like um, first past the post with um, multiple candidates and multiple tallies. So uh, once once we sort of uh, realised this, then uh, so specifically we looked at instant runoff elections, which is not entirely like the Australian system, but it's it's uh, more complicated. Uh, than first past the post, and it's sort of related to uh, preferential voting. And again, what we saw is that in these particular voting protocols, they are a special case of first past the post with multiple candidates, and so we get the same uh, idea that for these two particular privacy questions, we can, uh, we can release the results without actually impacting the... Um, uh, the of, uh, of privacy. So now, uh, so the interesting thing here is that for uh, where you think that the privacy uh, risk is highest is in those small uh, numbers of voters. Okay, so there's obviously an increase uh, in the privacy risk. So here's just some graphs that we did um, for the particular question of the uh, the probability that you can guess at least one uh, voter's vote. And what here, it, along here is the, uh, the number of observations by which I mean the, um, think of it as the, uh, the number of candidates, the permutation of the number of candidates. So it's, an, it's the range of um, observations that you see rather than sort of repeating doing repeated runs. So this is the, uh, just think of it as the related to the number of candidates in the election. And up here is the, is the, uh, the risk um, in terms of the, diff the, the information leak for the Bayes risk style entropy. And here, these different colors are the number of, uh, of voters in the election. So here we've, we can only do small numbers because uh, Ca the calculations get really, really big. Um, so, but for here, you can see that for n equals two, the loss, um, the more uh, information in terms of the number of candidates available, then it's quite likely that you can, that your vote can be identified. And it's because, given the um, observation, if you're in a situation where both voters voted for the same candidate, which is going to be like quite likely, then you know definitely who, what the voters voted for. And this is when, and this shows you therefore that the change in 
strategy is very effective when you've got a small number of voters. But of course, where the privacy really comes from in voting is that there's a huge number of voters. So when you're getting down to about uh, 18 voters, you've only got about uh, a 12% uh, pain, uh, increased risk in privacy. So, and of course, our, um, uh, our theoretical analysis shows that this risk sort of goes down to zero as the, um, as the, uh, as the people voting sort of increase. But for these small numbers, there is sort of an appreciable increase in risk. So how does that apply for uh, the, the particular situation here? So it's quite interesting because what's happened... So this is not a probability of this particular event. This event, particular event actually happened. And so you might want to give some advice to the Electoral Commission to say, well, there is some privacy loss for the people that voted here. But actually, when you think about it, the strategy of the attacker, if he sees this, is that he will guess that a voter voted for this guy. And that's exactly the same as his strategy would be if only you released the compiled um, uh, votes. So this is saying that in this particular scenario, the attacker doesn't isn't able to gain his uh, isn't able to gain anything through this observation. And so where that 45% came from in the the two case came from all of the other scenarios which didn't actually happen. Okay, this is the thing that actually happened, and where that 45% came from was in all of the other possible scenarios that were calculated in the risk. So you might be able to say, well, in this case, because, you know, we've got plausible deniability here, it's fine to release these results. I mean, if I have a friend who says he's a communist, he goes to Sydney and votes, and there's no vote for communists, there, I know he was lying to me. Right, so, privacy is so you would ask a different privacy question there. This you is say privacy is not the, you speak generalize this and political decision makers use this data to draw the wrong conclusion. Uh, so I'm just telling you what the maths is, is telling us. I'm not saying that people should use this. This is ridiculous, <laughs> honestly. So maybe we can talk about that afterwards. Okay, so how much? I'm at the end. Okay, so we can do we can do this again for side channel analysis. Uh, so here we've got a. Uh, um, so here we've got uh, this. This is a little piece of code which is calculating uh, something raised to the power of something else, and um, and here there is a. Uh, here there is a defense for the leak in this particular piece of code. Um, and we, again, we can apply this kind of uh, idea to, um, uh, to measure how effective is this uh, information flow. So in conclusion, uh, so quantitative information flow gives the ability to define relevant scenarios. Uh, we can define a refinement relation, so we can really say that one program leaks less than another program. And uh, by applying these uh, uh, concepts in real situations means that we can actually measure how much information is leaking, for example, in voting protocols. Um, finally, we can develop source-level reasoning this is where we want to go to develop source level reasoning to show that protocols leak no more information than the, some specification. And uh, we can develop tools, uh, hopefully, which can actually measure information leaks and relate them exactly to particular uh, uh, scenarios um, modeled using this general.
it's like a mass like yeah. That one? Yeah, I think so. So this, yeah. so this was the prior one, but there's some it's not because of this discrete distribution that we <coughs> continue the distribution we have got the integral, right? Yes, you do. So we should change with the integral. Um what you say is because the probability what the probability doesn't matter if it's discrete or continuous zero. So you can do all of this thing for continuous as well, but maths just gets more complicated. Does it, you just replace the sum with an integral? Or Pretty much, yes. Okay. Any other questions? So you, you just remarked that in this uh, rolling uh, thing, that you have to choose carefully what kind of final mm -hmm. question we have. So how do you how do you decide what's the right question? Well, so uh, so I'm not a voting expert, so we just um, thought we'll try those two, um, and then when we actually talked to voting experts, we said, could you? We just tried these because we didn't know, um, uh, and people are sort of so we're also voting with the electoral commission in Australia and in New South Wales. And so when we talked to them about that particular data, they said, yes, we are aware that there's this problem, this potential problem with uh, breaching privacy, but um, we don't do anything about it yet. So there's, there's basically pe people who work in elections, they know that there's potentially some privacy issues, especially with, well, with these small numbers, right? So, um, and... Uh, but they don't, no, nobody's actually met, tried to measure any of this kind of stuff. So nobody knows what it actually means. Um, so we just asked, to, so we just proposed those two questions. We talked to some uh, academics in Australia who were working in voting. They said, well, yeah, they're, they're quite good questions. Let's just see what comes out. So really, I don't know whether they're the right questions to be asking. And, um, and it all comes down to, you know, what risks are you worried about? And that really comes from experts. But this, it, this simply gives a, a view of, uh, of uh, you know, it, it, it actually gives you some sort of view about what is leaking and how important it is. And very likely there's sort of better questions to ask, but um, we haven't done that. OK, thanks. If there are no more questions, oh, no, Alex, yeah. So just to understand completely with respect to the, the scenario you discussed, you could also pose the question in terms of the chance of finding out whether a particular person voted for one particular party. Yes. And then you could apply the same techniques. And in, uh, this, in yeah. the scenario that you described, you would learn that this is a relevant scenario. Right? The fact that there's yes. a zero in that box would That's tell you right. That exactly. Ex yeah, exactly. Um, so, uh, it's really pointing out to which are the scenarios which are most worrisome. So if everybody's voting in that small scenario, which could very easily happen for one particular candidate, then you, and you know who those people are, then you know that they voted, or you know that they didn't vote for somebody, so which could, which, which could equally be a problem. But you could, you could, in theory, apply your analysis to these questions too. Right? I think say, so. I mean, given that I know, maybe I even know or think I know two of the votes of the people here. Yes. Then, in which scenarios do I learn something meaningful about everybody else? Yeah, exactly. That's way. right. And, and how much, uh, how sure do you become? Because that, that's telling you something. The more sure you are that somebody voted one way rather than another way, is telling you something. And, and that could possibly be used. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you.